Welcome to New York Wine and Grape Foundation's New York State of Wine. Thank you all for taking the time out to be with us today. Diverse and bold with a long history of stretching back hundreds of years, New York Wine is reinventing itself as an epicenter of dynamic winemaking. The state is home to the first winery in the United States and producers are drawing on that background to introduce some of the most exciting wines in the country. In this inaugural episode, we focus on New York wines and their place in the world. So before we introduce the panel, some housekeeping reminders for everyone. During the webinar, note that there are two communication methods available to participants, a chat section and a Q&A section. The chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other participants. Just be sure to select everyone in the to field as it can default to panelists only. The Q&A section is where we'd like you to submit your questions to be answered during the webinar. And now for the panel, our host and moderator today is Richard Siddle. He is an award-winning business journalist and editor with over 25 years experience working across a number of fields, including drinks, computing, grocery retail, convenience, and travel. He now runs his own B2B website, thebuyer.net, aimed at the premium on trade and the wine and drinks supply chain that supports it. He, has pre he was previously editor of Harper's Wine and Spirit for nearly 10 years. And Richard has been particularly, particularly successful in championing the causes of small retailers, retailers and businesses across the different channels he has worked in. And joining Richard are Ame Lassine Nu, the NYC brand ambassador for Lieb Cellars, a certified sustainable winery on the North Fork, North Fork of Long Island, New York, and their second label, Bridge Lane Wine, bringing extensive experience in wine retail and hospitality to the team. She's a graduate of Louisiana Scholars College, recognized as cer certified sommelier by the Court of Master Sommeliers Americas, and a WSET diploma candidate. As a freelance wine and spirits judge, Ame has served on panels both locally and internationally in Paris, Beijing, Spain, Bulgaria, and Switzerland, in addition to having visited vineyards across New York, Napa, Portugal, Bordeaux, Italy, and the Republic of Georgia. Richard Rainey is managing partner of Forge Cellars. For more than two decades, Richard has been involved in all aspects of the distribution business, from his role as a wine buyer for a French portfolio to managing a team of nine salespeople, he naturally gravitates to working in partnership with growers and alongside the vines, but also enjoys the cellar as it is the culmination of all their hard work. And they're working hard now as we're in the middle of harvest. So Christopher Bates, MS, has spent over 25 years in all aspects of the hospitality industry, lending him a well-rounded perspective of all facets. Christopher and his wife, Isabel, own and operate Element Winery, among many other hospitality businesses in the Finger Lakes. In 2012, Christopher was named Best Young Sommelier in the World after winning Best Young Sommelier in America previously in the year and passed his Master Somm exam in May 2013. More recently, Christopher was included in Wine Enthusiast Top 40 Under 40 Tastemakers list. So let's get started. Over to you, Richard. Thank you, thank you, thank you Katie, and uh, welcome to everybody. Um, hope you can all hear me. Uh, there, um, yeah, it's, it's great to have everybody, everybody on board um, and, of course, welcome all those who've, who are joining us from all over the world. I mean, the, the wonders of Zoom means we've got people from literally everywhere, from South America to across America to Europe. So um, welcome to, to everybody. Um, and, of course, obviously to the winemakers and the wine producers who are obviously in harvest. Um, in a way, it, it does seem strange in a way to talk about New York, uh, New York wine as, as somehow a place still... For many people to discover uh, uh, New York being such an iconic city and such an influential city around the world it, it's, it sort of seems uh, strange that we've, we've, we've the world is yet to really understand or get to know New York wine as, as well as it perhaps um, could do or can do um, and I know this is the first of a few series of webinars where the idea really is to try and uh, introduce people and um, and, and, and allow people who, who well, obviously at the moment we can't travel, but even even when we, we can travel to perhaps hopefully get people to understand New York a little bit more and introduce and hopefully list more of their wines in their markets. So um, as Katie um, explained, we've got um, different winemakers, diff different wine, wine producers from different parts of uh, the state. Um, 
rather than sort of like me go to all of you and then we all sort of go through what exactly what you do, I thought perhaps it'd be best if we kicked off and sort of purposes of the, uh, the, the delegates really, the audience, just to sort of like say from your point of view, you know, what, 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 what do you think are kind of New York's, New York State's big calling card? You know, what, what's the elevator pitch that you, that you find yourself doing day in, day out? But what is it about New York State that you would encourage people to want to find more, out, more about? Who wants to go first? Hello. Hi. Um, well, first of all, I think if you want to simplify, um, of course, Riesling and Cab Franc are key varietals to rely on, but I, I wholeheartedly believe that there's no need to squelch diversity for the sake of simplicity. So um, today's consumers are more adventurous and I think it's time to explore. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, perhaps Christopher, you're, you're, you're a master, you're a master of many, aren't you? You're, you're, you're a man who's uh, used to trying to convince uh, people to buy wine from all over the world. You know, if you're, if you're trying to introduce somebody to, to New York for the first time, what, what are the, the things that you sort of say, what makes New York different? I mean, I think one of the most important things to remember about New York is due to our kind of unique set of climates in both, uh, you know, what, what Ame is working with and what Rick and I are working with up here um, and sort of all of our peers in, in other parts of New York, I think one of the keys is really understanding that the wines that this place produces are elegant, bright, sort of delicate wines. They're not wines that are built on sort of power and intensity. These are wines that I think are really kind of, of, of geared towards a little bit more old world in style. And, and I think that that's a really important thing for people to remember when they're first jumping onto them is that these wines really, for me, are not about power and intensity. They're about elegance and finesse. They're about delicacy and layering and all of that fun stuff. And sort of to jump on what I said as well, I mean, I think one of the keys is, is we've got some flagships that we're starting with, but I think one of the things that makes the Finger Lakes really exciting is we're still in the discovery phase and we're still very, very early on. And I think our understanding of both potential for what can grow here, but also where it can grow here and how we grow it. So I think all of those things are for me are what make New York really exciting is sort of this isn't like these powerhouse wines that we see from a lot of the new world. And there's still a lot of experimentation. There's still a lot to learn. And I think there's still, you know, I think where we are, I think is really good. And I think where we can go is going to be even better. Yeah. Yeah. To, to jump on that, Richard, I think, uh, every, every, everything Christopher said, you know, locally we, um, because we're, we're in the US, everybody says, oh, do we look west? Do we look to California? Do we look to Washington? Do we look to Oregon? And frankly, we look east. Uh, we look towards Europe. This is really where we have more connection uh, because of this stylistically higher acid, fresher wines, more minerality, great texture without heaviness, lower alcohols. And, and this is way more of a European ideal, I think. Um, and it's a, more of a connection. I mean, I have a I have a French partner uh, whose family's been around for a very long time. I don't think he would have been interested to do a project in the U.S. if, if he didn't like the, the, the wines and the style, right? Um, I think he probably would have looked somewhere else. And uh, I, I think we have a lot of connections with, with Europe more so than definitely the U.S. in many, many ways. Yeah, and it's interesting the fact that, you know, as you say, your, your business partner or, you know, is, is from France, so you've actually looked east yourself for for that influence and you know you've, you've come together that that way yeah my all of our points of reference uh in the cellar how we work is very much related to how our sister estate works in gigandas we use a lot of the same parameters the grapes are different of course but the same ideas are in play i mean we we have a you know a pretty big exchange program louis here we have other people that come we if we have questions, we're on Zoom calls. So uh, it's a pretty big influence in the way we work, that's for sure. Okay, well, perhaps we should drill a little bit into quite why, you know, your wines are, as you say, um, full, of acid, full of, acid, of acid, and there's this freshness and there's this elegance to them. Um, and now, obviously, you know, we, we think of New York 
as a city and anyone's traveled there during the winter you know it's it's a pretty brutal place to go to to to, to go to spend new year i think I, I went to new year new york about four or five years ago and you think it was the coldest night that they've had or something and uh, yeah it was just mental I had to go, go, out, go out and buy a whole new suitcase of clothes but i mean so you so the idea then of like making making wine just up the road admittedly quite a long way away but only up the road is is does seem like how does how does this happen so Perhaps do you want to pick up on the climate and, and quite how that shapes the styles of wine that you're making? Especially since you said just down the road. I mean, we're 80 miles east of New York City and um, our winemaker, Russell Hearn, he's been with us since 1993. And he uh, talks about the, the whole reason Long Island and the North Fork of Long Island has a wine industry to begin with that's 100% vinifera is the fact that we have a maritime climate. So I'm sure most people viewing today understand what benefits maritime climates have for a wine growing region. But just to, to recap, uh, so in the winter time, we're better protected against those extreme cold northeastern weather uh, temperatures coming down because of the moderating uh, influence and we're, we're surrounded by water. We'll see a slide in a, in a little bit. Um, also, because of the water, uh, still being cold in the spring, it delays bud break, which ensures that, um, well, hopefully <laughs> ensures that we can avoid um, the early frosts. And then we, the reverse happens too in the fall, where the water is still warm and that increases our harvest uh, by three weeks or so, a long, longer period than, than most areas in, in New York. Um, and then because of the constant breeze, that's, that's great for airflow in the vineyards and our sandy loam soil, good drainage. So all those factors, um, People make comparisons to Bordeaux, some, okay. some, um, but there are surprises too. Perhaps Christopher, do you want to pick up on the kind of the climate side of things and, and what? Yeah, sure. So uh, by American standards, we're a hop, skip and a jump away from New York City ourselves. It's just a cool crisp 250 miles here. Um, <laughs> we are much further inland. So while Ame was talking about Long Island, which is literally an island stuck in the ocean, giving it an incredible amount of moderation. When we move further and further away from that, we become more of a continental climate, which means that we're far more extreme. So colder winters and hotter summers typically. And you could feel it quite physically if you drive, you know, if you spend a day in New York City and then a day up here in the Finger Lakes, you're gonna see much colder nights, you're gonna see much hotter days up here. Um, now, people oftentimes talk about this area as a cool climate, and I think that it is, but it can be a little bit misleading for people. Oftentimes, I think people think about us as a cool climate, and they think that that means that we struggle to ripen fruit. And I think that that's, a really, uh, that, that's really not the big thing that you need to take away from our climate. Probably the biggest and most important thing is, is that our struggle here is not ripening fruit. It's getting it to survive the cold winters. We don't have that extreme moderation from an ocean. So what we have to count on is the moderation that comes actually from something you can see on this map, which is those finger lakes, 11 glacially carved lakes. And I think Rick will probably talk a little bit more about that later for us. But um, these 11 glacially carved lakes that are very deep, that one right in the center that you see next to Geneva, it's called Seneca Lake. And that lake is 750 feet deep or so. On either to the right of it, we see Cayuga and to the left is Penyan. While there are 11 Finger Lakes, those three are the most important. And really, I would argue that right now, most of the vinifera focus is happening really around Seneca Lake right there in the middle because it is the deepest. Now, here's the thing. People oftentimes focus on that as our moderating influence, but they forget about the real big body of water just north of us that's barely shown on this map, which is Lake Ontario. And it's all really about that big giant lake, which essentially is our ocean, if you will. And it's the size of an ocean, it feels like, um, that essentially moderates the cold winter weather that comes down from the north. 
Um, and that is one of the biggest things because without that moderation of Lake Ontario and then without sort of the micro moderation that we see from the Finger Lakes themselves, it's too cold here in the winter for, for vinifera to really survive. So that's one of the biggest impacts. Now, with that though, you gotta remember overall our climate is cool, but in a way it's a little counterintuitive when you think about our growing cycle. What I mean by that is we have a short growing season in a lot of ways. Essentially, we start two months later, a month and a half later than most other kind of new world regions that you would consider. So we have a late start to our bud break, which is, as I may said, good, because it means that it helps get us away from frosts, but it does give us a little bit late start in the season. Um, and one of the things that I think happens is, is that we end up with a really efficient growing season. We don't have this these like nine months of growing, like you might Napa or something like that. What we have is May to kind of a hard ripening stop somewhere in mid October. This can be early October, can be late October, can, can sometimes be September it feels like, um, where all of a sudden, you know, we get our frosts and our season pretty much slows to a grinding halt. Um, so one of the keys to that though, is the efficiency of ripening. And what I mean by that is when you took it, like when you look at a grapevine, it ripens between like 50 degrees and 85 degrees, much above that. And it shuts down any below that and it shuts down. So when we look at these hotter climate places, whether you're talking about Mendoza or Barossa or Napa or Walla Walla or a place like that, where you might think, oh, they've got a really great growing season. It's always hot. The reality is, is that they'll be sh their vines will be shut down from stress, either heat or, or water stress for months during that growing season. And here in the Finger Lakes, while we don't get hot, we have a pretty consistently like 70 to 85 degree summer every day, every single day it's ripening here. So for me, one of the things that I think is really in exciting is we have this efficiency of growing season. Yeah, it's interesting. In fact, you see this week, we've got uh, someone from, from Buenos Aires who's just, just uh, joined the, uh, the session and um, you, you go to Argentina and, and everyone there is talking about the how they make their wines low on alcohol, it's obviously because they're, they're picking much earlier. And it's all about canopy management and, and picking grapes, you know, weeks and months earlier than these two. So uh, perhaps Rick, do you, do you want to pick up on this whole uh, late bud break um, and, and go into how that really then helps in terms of the actual style of wine, and then obviously talk, talk about uh, the finger legs as well. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, for, I mean, my focus is about 80% on dry Riesling, uh, a bit of Pinot Noir, and uh, just a dab of Cap Franc. But uh, speaking of Riesling, what we love is this very, for us, a, a fairly long physiologically ripening period. So I can pick mid-October, but I've picked as late as November. And the beauty of Riesling is, for us, uh, we don't gain alcohol. So the, the Riesling curve, kind of the alcohol accumulation curve, kind of flattens. But the physiological curve will continue to, to go up. So you can start, say, with a 12-degree alcohol Riesling, and you can pick it. And if you want a, a style that is more of a citrus style, more kind of uh, apple, and citrus components, you can pick fairly early. If you want to go more towards quince, quince and peach and, and pear, you can pick later, but you still end up with the same amount of alcohol and maybe varying degrees of, of acid. And that, for me, that's, and, and for Louis as well, this is what we loved because uh, it gives us so many options to work with uh, and it gives us very big windows. So instead of sometimes managing ripeness, I'm actually, uh, I'm in a way chasing it, which we know is uh, the great wine regions of the world, right? Are always those places right on the edge of where you should be growing grapes. Um, and I think, you know, the Finger Lakes is certainly one of those places. Um, the, rolling back though, um, talking about the elevator pitch, I encourage people to follow New York because, you know, I've traveled, you know, throughout France for, for many, many years. And most places you go, 99% uh, of the time, the, the, the book has been written, so to speak. Uh, in the Finger Lakes, it's, it's pretty cool because we're writing it. Every year we learn so many new things. I mean, gosh, 10 years ago, this is my 10th vintage year. 
in it seems like eons ago and what's changed in 10 years has been dramatic so i have french producers come here and i and you know we walk around i'm like very rarely will you get to see a region being birthed in front of your eyes it's happening right now in front like a fine wine region with immense potential is being born and because it's the u.s it's probably it goes faster because we're we don't have quite the 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 you know restrictions maybe some european places do so we can kind of do anything we can break rules we can plow forward so uh i think that's also one of the interesting points about about new york for sure yeah so in a way you're, you're, you're kind of for some of the classic old world varieties, but you're very much a kind of a new, well, you're, not, you're more than a new world, you're a sort of new region, you know, it's, uh, it's still yeah. very fresh. Yeah, very fresh. Yeah. Can I, just before we, um, we we're, we're probably going to fall out with our audience because we actually have some wines we're going to taste and show, but uh, unfortunately we're the only ones who are going to be tasting them. So I apologise for that. But um, just before we do that, I mean, just as a sort of quick, uh, sort of postcard, sort of like information in terms of the different AVAs they are. Um, I mean, I mean, I know that when I, mean, I mentioned there, you know, at the beginning about you know being New York City, but obviously the, the actual states like fifty five thousand square meters or something. It's an enormous, vast area. Um, I mean, are the wines being made in Long Island one hundred percent different from what's been made in 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 the lakes, or or are there similarities? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think that there's a huge variation and, you know, ultimately, I mean, I think probably the Finger Lakes and, and Long Island have been maybe the first forerunners in, in, in really developing what's possible in those areas. But, you know, we see more and more other AVAs popping up and I think that we're going to also continue to see more exciting things coming out of whether it's Hudson or Upper Hudson, whether it's, um, I mean, Lake Erie to me is a an area that seems like it should have a lot of potential. And another one for me that's like Niagara Escarpment, I think the potential there is absolutely huge. So um, we do talk, we do have a, a, a number of different AVAs. And then even within the, the bigger Appalachians, I mean, we've got three AVAs here in the Finger Lakes. The Seneca and Cayuga, I think each have their own AVA. Um, and, you know, down in Long Island is the same. So, but for me, I think, yeah, there's a lot of potential kind of across this board. As Rick talked about, I think we're Long Island and Finger Lakes are kind of at the forefront of, of, of pushing that. But, you know, I don't know that in 20 years, we're not going to see one of these other regions sort of at the same at the same tier. Brilliant. Okay, well, perhaps, um, Amy, if, Amy, if we go um, and, and talk specifically more about Long Island and, and where where Lieb Sellers is, is, is and, and what you're making there, because you're, one of your specialities, obviously, is sparkling wine. So this is true. Yes. Definitely. Um, so, so while you're getting out your, your wine, Richard, um, we, we talked briefly earlier about uh, being surrounded by water. And here you can see it on the Google map. Um, so Long Island is an AVA, but we are a, a smaller AVA within that AVA, the North Fork of Long Island. And there um, we're heavily influenced by the water. You'll see on the north side the Long Island Sound, then to the south the Great Peconic Bay, and of course the Atlantic Ocean to the east. So combine this with the well-draining soils, uh, sandy loam. I was uh, in the vineyards the other day before they started harvest and I was uh, having fun just poking my finger in, in little clumps that I found and it would uh, immediately disperse like uh, like facial powder. Um, so it just really illustrated to me how well draining this is. Uh, the roots are not staying in water like they would if there was a heavier clay soil. Um, and uh, let's get the wine. Why don't we? So here we have our Lieb Cellars 2017 Estate Sparkling Pinot Blanc. Now, fun fact about this Pinot Blanc, um, we do a still one as well. And um, 
we have the largest contiguous planting of Pinot Blanc in the country. Who knew? <laughs> Spark. So, and, um, and, yes. and in terms of sparking that's made in the state, is, is Long Island the main area for sparking? Or can you give us, a, give us a sort of a context in terms of where sparking is being made and what, what Long Island is? Um, there, I mean, there's, there's a producer, one of our neighbors, who only uh, makes sparkling wine. So um, I think it is conducive to uh, making great sparkling wines. Yeah. Uh, this particular <laughs> one, yeah? So I say this is a very for me. This is like a got great texture, and it's good. Quite a, it's a it's a deep sparkling. It's it's um mm -hmm. it's what twenty two months on leaves. I mean, it's um correct average. You know, it's um a hundred percent Pinot Blanc. Uh, mm -hmm. We also make a sparkling rosé, but to smaller uh, quantities. This uh there's to this vintage uh, nine hundred twenty one cases made, and it's made in the traditional method. No, that's really nice. It's lovely. And again, so, it's, it's, uh, it's around about 13% alcohol on this. Uh, yes. We yeah. say 13.2, but I understand in, uh, in oh, your the, market, the, it, we do have to say 13, right? <laughs> no, actually, it, it did say 13.2. I just thought I'd say around 13, just to be polite. There you go. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, but, yeah. But, but, but it, I mean, in terms of what New York's famous for, is, is sparkling uh, an area that you think has got, got potential for, for the state as a whole? Or for sparkling Long is an area in, for New York wines that we can help fulfill in the global trends, uh, increasing global trends. Sparkling, sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, we are certified sustainable at Leeb Cellars through Long Island wine growing they're they're a third party um, the only one um certification on the east coast okay well perhaps if we, we, we change tack I mean, obviously we've got lots of people from around the world listening um and um just in terms of where new york from your own perspective but also as a state in terms of where international focus is um from your experiences i mean how well or what are the opportunities that you're finding for new york wines in different markets around the world. Um, perhaps Christopher, you do you want to start off in, in terms of what your what kind of opportunities you're seeing and, and, and how, yeah. how New York is doing internationally? Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's a couple of things to think about. Um, for me, I started the winery uh, 11 years ago with the idea of essentially really trying to um, kind of uh, broaden the perspective of what's possible here in the Finger Lakes and then really try to um, in, enhance sort of the reputation domestically, globally about what the potential here in the Finger Lakes is. Um, it was really kind of my goals from the beginning and it's been really funny because, um, you know, a big part of it has been having to change the perception that people had about the Finger Lakes. Uh, especially locally and I never really thought much about it until I was off doing like some education in Japan about about Finger Lakes wines where all of a sudden I realized I didn't have to uh, explain anything about the way our wines tasted in the past because they never tasted them before so it was fun to realize that like as I'm out in the like locally it can be really hard to get people to give our wines a shot again um, or a shot for the first time, but internationally and even on a, even on a national standard, um, I mean, I find it way easier to go to California and get people really excited about what we're making than I do right here in our own backyard in a lot of cases. Um, and then, yeah, whether I'm in London or I'm in Oslo or, or Hong Kong, like it's a whole new set of of wines that people have never had experience with. And for the most part, especially as, you know, I think global wine trends have shifted a little bit as, you know, the Robert Parker's and Wine Spectator's voice has, has maybe had more voices join them on the global stage of telling people what, what good wine can be. You know, as we've seen the rise of the Insta Psalm and things like that, telling us that like light and delicate wines are cool. Everything doesn't have to be purple anymore. Um, seeing a whole lot more excitement for all of this. So. To me, I think it's been really cool to see the growth and the interest around the world for what's happening here. And once, you know, once we put wine in front of people and they get to taste it, 
uh, especially with context as to what you know we're trying for and what we expect out of these wines. I think it's pretty easy after that. Yeah. So, so Rick, from your point of view, I mean, what kind of uh, what, what's the perception that you come across from buyers when you're you know, in international shows or trying to trying to show wines to to sommeliers around the world? Sure, absolutely. Um, really, exactly what Christopher says, because they don't have any preconceived notions. They're if they're professionals. Um, they, they want a wine that expresses a place, a moment, um, and we have that. I mean, there's plenty of wine out there that tastes nice, but it may be a bit innocuous. It, it may not have a, any really identity. There's plenty of good wine being made across the world that tastes fairly similar. So when we show up and we can see, show these textural white wines and, and red wines that aren't heavy, that have freshness and have a real sense of place, uh, it, it becomes, it's a lot easier. Um, the local market in our backyard, like Chris was saying, is probably the highest, is the hardest because of preconceived notions over many, many years. Um, and, and that's okay. That was part of the, that's part of the evolution of a region. You had many people before us that maybe didn't have formal training, didn't have uh, financial resources. They were farmers and they were doing the very, very best they could at the time. So there were successes, there were failures, there were challenges. So, you know, uh, people that tasted the wines 15 years ago, um, what's happened in the last 10 has so dramatically changed. Um, but boy, I tell you, when I, when I travel, yeah, uh, it's, it's a joy because here, you know, every day the work is the work and you travel and people are so excited to taste the wines. Uh, right before COVID, I was in Miami, and uh, I was in Naples and Miami several days before, two days before everything shut down, and the response was just off the hook, and in there, you know, you have to understand Miami is an incredibly international community, uh, so you have influences all over the world, so you can meet with a French sommelier, you can meet with a Cuban sommelier, you can meet with a sommelier from, from Italy, and so I, I met with Russian sommelier, I was, I saw so many different people and the response was always the same. They're like, wow, I, I can't even, you know, I don't know these wines. Why don't I know more about them? And the general excitement was off the hook. Unfortunately, COVID hit and, and now we have to wait a little bit before we resume the conversation. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's wonderful to travel and, uh, and see the responses because I think at the end of the day, people want wines with a sense of place and New York is definitely giving them and they're approachable. They're not terribly expensive. People can afford them. Uh, because we're a new and emerging region, we, we have to be sharp. And uh, we're able to bring this to the table at, at a pretty good price point. Yeah, I think that, that last point there you make is particularly, particularly uh, I mean, I'm sitting here in London, so you know, uh, I'm familiar with doing uh, trade panel debates with uh, buyers here. And of course, the word price comes up quite quickly in any, <laughs> any debate we have. And, uh, but I mean, we, we did a panel actually just before, before lockdown in, in with uh, quite a few of the major importers in the UK. And, and uh, yeah, and a lot of them were obviously bringing in lots of wine from California, but New York was still very new to them. And um, it, it, there was a real you know, buzz and excitement about tasting, you know, so like you say, stars of Riesling, but actually finding stars of Riesling that they can't find in Austria, they can't find in Germany. It was like, my God, this is, this is Riesling, but not as I know it. Um, which, uh, you know, so can I ask you in terms of when you're internationally, what, what, what channels are working best for you in terms of which parts of the market are, are really sort of capturing the spirit of New York? Uh, for me, at least in Japan, it was, uh, it's definitely early on, it was retail. Uh, we've had good success with retail there. We have a good retail partner. Um, in France and Germany, it's been restaurants, which, uh, that's what makes this whole thing so difficult is because the restaurants have the ability to tell the stories like nobody else. They have uh, you, uh, typically a higher you know, level of education on the wines. Uh, they have the, the ability to converse with the, the customers in a relaxed atmosphere. They have the ability to tell the story. Then, then most importantly, with our wines, this fresh, higher acid style, they have the ability to have it with food. Yeah. And not having that outlet, not having those partners right now, at least in the U.S. and even, you know, 
to a large degree in Europe. Um, that that's been that's been tough. So we need to pivot and find more partners that are uh, retail, obviously for the short term, uh, mm -hmm. until the restaurant gets back up. But that that's been where we've had great successes in the restaurant business. Yeah. Amy, uh, uh, what, what experiences have you had in, internationally in terms of what's, what's really been working for you? Sure, sure, Richard. I may. Um, so, um, our director of sales, Mike Cook, says our focus is mainly domestic right now. We're in 15 different states and expanding. But um, as far as uh, internationally, we are at the beginning of making these connections and um, seeing where we go from there and definitely uh, increased interest in the last two years from overseas. Um, just personally, uh, I'm seeing a potential alignment with Norway because bag and boxes are very popular there. I think like 60% of retail and uh, that's something that our second label Bridgling can help with because we we were pioneers in the state for alternative packaging the first in the state to do cans um, bag and box and kegs and uh, I see much potential with that excellent okay well that we'll, we'll um we, we, we talked at the beginning there about you know what New York is, has has become or is becoming more famous about it is, it is these sort of classic varieties and, and I suppose you know Riesling and um, Cabernet Franc is, are, are, are two of the big kind of like uh, calling cards from New York and um, we're just going to like just show some examples of those so um, so Rick I mean you're obviously specializing in Riesling do you want to talk us through your approach to Riesling and you've, you've, we've got a wine here I think we're going to we're going to share as well so over to you on that. Happily I'm, I'm probably uh... I'm fully committed to, to dry Riesling, but I probably should be fully committed because the, <laughs> the dry Riesling business is a, is a unique proposition. Um, and it's the potential is huge, but um, you know, it's not the easiest place to be. Right. Uh, but all sommeliers love Riesling. Uh, it's everybody's kind of favorite grape, but it's probably one of the, the most difficult grapes to sell because it can be so many things. Uh, we, from the beginning, were always committed to less than four grams uh, residual, but typically around two grams. So we are dry. I have a tendency to pick pretty late because of that. Um, because I, I, I really need to have texture and I need to have rich, richness in the absence of sugar, uh, we have to push the boundaries, and we and we do each year. But that's that's the beauty of being in the Finger Lakes because I, I can have this very long ripening season, so I can pick fully ripe grapes. We our winemaking is it's nothing crazy. Pick well, keep the yields um, in perspective. I probably am around four four point two five tons of the acre for Riesling, which is fairly low. Um, I would say the, uh, the average yields in the Finger Lakes can easily be six without a problem. So we do have a tendency to have lower yields. Find great sites, uh, manage the canopies very, very well. So we have a very long, prolonged ripening period, meaning a good amount of leaf removal, uh, cluster thinning. Um, pick by hand when we can. The, the, the reality is that uh, we have a lot of vineyards, and so some stuff I have to pick by machine, some stuff I pick by hand. Whole cluster, uh, slow presses. Um, I have three medium-sized presses, so I can handle quite a bit of Riesling at one point uh, in a very short window, and I think that's very important because what I haven't done is spread my picking window out very, very large. I keep it fairly tight, so we can handle a lot of Riesling at one time. Uh, off to the, to the stainless steel overnight, we settle. And then about 80% goes in uh, neutral barrels anywhere between 228 to up to 600. So we have 228s, 400, 500, 600s. Uh, we've developed since about 2012 a pretty uh, deep spontaneous fermentation program. Leave the wine in barrels and gross leaves over the winter and typically bottle uh, mid-summer. Um, and the, the idea is we want great ethereal aromatics, but length and texture. Um, we're real texture guys at Forge, 
And um, more importantly is really where we're fully committed is to the vineyards. So I work in around 21 different sites within about an eight mile stretch. So Louis calls us like little, the little Cistercians, you know, because we're, it's a very Burgundian mentality that I employ. I was a Burgundy buyer and that's kind of where my frame of reference comes from. Golden slope along here that I focus on. Um, the, the thing that's so interesting geologically about this region and, and why we have so many stories to tell is the mother rock here, which is Devonian shale was basically created 300 million years ago. And because of the glaciation, we have a, this, this mother rock is exposed to us. And this is what, for me, one of the great, great things about this region and is one of the things that drew Louis here because you can see it. You have, uh, this is at the top of your screen is north to the bottom is of course south. You see the mountain range is kind of all around us. And then you see this, this kind of worn down area right around the Finger Lakes. That was all, uh, all the same <laughs> until the glaciers came along and it buffed this area out and it removed all of this topsoil and redeposited it. So it gave us access to this magnificent shale um, that normally we wouldn't have had. So, you know, in Burgundy, for instance, you have the Salon Fault where you had this lifting action that gave access. Here, we don't have the lift so much. There was a lifting at the bottom of the screen where it created a, a fault line and it dumped all the water to the north. But really what happened was when this area was covered in glaciers, it peeled away all of this soil and it buffed down all of these mountains and it gave us access to the shale. Um, that's the exciting thing uh, because the mother rock is so special. But then it also did a number of other things, which is as the glaciers re uh, receded, last one was around 15,000 years ago, it dropped off some material. So in one vineyard, for instance, in my own home farm vineyard, uh, I have within a, you know, a hundred yard area, I can find perfect gravel. And then the next, go, the next scoop is perfect sand. And the next scoop is shale all in one area. And then boom, I'm into some blue clay. So the, the geology and the soils, we know so little about. And it's one of the reasons we try to work with so many sites. Uh, this year, I think we made something like 12 or 13 different single vineyard Rieslings, and we make them all exactly the same, but every single one is immensely different. And that, that, that's, that's pretty crazy within an eight mile stretch to have such diversity of flavors and ideas from salty, high altitude, gravelly Riesling that feel, makes you feel like you're at the seashore all the way down to close to the lake on 12 foot deep gravel created by uh, two parallel ravines that dumped all this material and having um, the flavor of sweet, perfectly ripe peaches, all under two or three grams of residual, all within a mile of each other. So this is what gets guys like Chris and myself and Louis so excited because we have an unlimited amount of stories that were finding here um, just within a very small small area the the screen that's up right now it's fun to look at because it basically just shows uh, the bedrock the shale bedrock and that yellow that wraps around Seneca Lake that goes all the way to the shores is is that's the holy grail right there it's friable shale that uh, for the most part can be easily broken um, and so the vines like it we do have some harder stuff, um, which there's another, another uh, slide in there somewhere that will show uh, one of the typical features of the neighborhood, which is a waterfall. Here is uh, one of the local waterfalls, and you can see that there's some big benches that are very hard, and then there's benches that are very soft. And that's what creates these beautiful waterfalls, because, of course, the soft layers erode faster than the hard. Um, but that gives you an idea of what we're dealing with. So when Louis saw that, in fact, as a Frenchman, um, he, he about came unglued when he saw this, this shale that's available to us.
Yeah, I guess that's the thing, isn't it? They go back to your, your French connections is, uh, and, and also your background, you know, working with Burgundy. You've, you've, it's, it's this uh, excitement of, of, of not, not even knowing what you've actually got there. You know, it's, it's, uh, you're making what you can now, but it's not like, you know, the word new is very pertinent for New York, you know. It's, um, you know, the work we've chosen is not work. And we're, um, most of us are self-funded guys. You know, Chris makes wine, runs many restaurants. I still work. Louis has his estate. But th this bug that uh, is a gift somewhere, which is this devotion to, to what we do. Well, it's a heck of a lot easier when you have such amazing canvas here in your backyard. There's so many stories. I don't know how you could ever get tired of making wine here. Uh, every year, I mean, it's terrible. I, I, have a, I have a collection problem, which is collecting vineyards. Um, I, every time I drive up, I find a new vineyard and I don't care if it's two acres, I'm pounding on the door because every single time I've done that, I've discovered a new story. So it, it's just, it, it's magical. And you know, every year in the cellar, there's two, two or three new sites that we've been working on that all of a sudden will come into their own. You know, uh, when I first started working with one site called Breakneck, the first year or two, we weren't sure. And then third, fourth year, due to some changes in the vineyard, all of a sudden it magically arrived. This yeah. year we bottled a vineyard that was planted in 1972 by a French guy named Charles Fournier. This is a vineyard that was never well taken care of. And we started applying some nice biological principles. And now this vineyard has exploded and become its own historically significant place. So there are so many stories here, so much great terroir. Uh, it's gonna keep us busy for some time now. Brilliant. Thank you for that, that's really interesting. Thank, and, and Chris, you're, you're, you're um, for more the right, the, 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 the right, right <laughs> the red wine <laughs> side of the fence. And um, you, you've talked us through kind of the wines that you're making. And I know, I know we've got one of your one of your wines to, to show today, which is the, uh, the Cabernet Franc, but I think you also do Syrah and other wines as well, don't you? So, Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I started out, uh, 2009 was my first vintage and I started making um, Riesling. And then in 2010, I started adding red wines to our uh, sort of portfolio. Um, you know, ultimately, our, we're a tiny little producer. I'm going to make 750 cases or something like that um, in total. And, but our goals have been really kind of big and they're really about, again, as I said, like kind of changing the way that Finger Lakes, the potential of the Finger Lakes is perceived around the world. Um, so kind of with that in mind, uh, I eventually stopped making white wine. Uh, I stopped making Riesling in 2014, really because the idea of, for me to fulfill that kind of goal and that mission, the most effective way for me to do that was really to focus on our red wine production. Um, I think there's a lot of a, a lot of great wineries out there really, really kind of beating the drum for Riesling and whether we're talking about Forge or Ravines or Weimar or any of our peers that are really pushing internationally what can be done with Riesling here in the area. For me, I felt that there was more opportunity for me to be impactful and to really fulfill that mission by focusing on our red production. So uh, that's really been our kind of jam. Uh, we started the winery to be a negociant um, with the idea of exploring m sort of as much, as Rick was talking about, as much sort of diversity as we could here in the Finger Lakes. And my whole goal really has been to try to create a style that is sort of emblematic of what the Finger Lakes as a whole can produce consistently. Cool. So um, I've really looked to try to work with different soil types, different aspects, different lakes, different expositions and all of that fun stuff, different growing methods, um, as well as different grapes through the years. But for me, kind of my core has always been uh, three grapes and it's been Cabernet Franc, Pinot Noir and Syrah. Um, and they to me are, are grapes that I think work really, really well here. Um, but Cabernet Franc is probably the most typical here in the Finger Lakes for red grapes. And one of the reasons much like Riesling is that it's quite cold hardy, which when we look at the way that um, the, the history of the Finger Lakes that we don't have time to get into. I think Rick touched on it real quick for just a second to talk about, you know, the farmers have passed here, but ultimately the knowledge base has changed really drastically, I think, in the last 
20, 30 years. And the sort of understanding of our space has changed a lot as well. So historically, the kind of, let's just put it in and see method and methodology uh, meant that more sensitive grapes didn't survive as well. Chardonnay, Merlot, um, uh, all struggled a little bit more. Uh, but things like Cabernet Franc and Riesling, as long as you can see a lake, you can pretty much stick them in the ground and they, they have a good potential to survive. So Cab Franc for me is really stuck as one of the icons here in the Finger Lakes, simply because it has the ability to be planted in probably the, one of the widest majorities of vineyard areas of any other red grape. Now, that being said, one of the biggest things that I think is really important because I hear it all the time, people ask, you know, how is it that you can, that you can say that the Finger Lakes make great sparkling wine and I'm, I'm planting Grenache in my vineyard. Uh, how is that possible that I'm doing that? The reality is the Finger Lakes are freaking huge. Like th this region is 90 miles east to west, 60 miles north to south. So if you overlay that over a more traditional or typical wine region that you're thinking about, it covers everything from the heart of Napa Valley all the way out to the coast of Sonoma. It would cover everything from, you know, the northern part of Burgundy all the way down to the Rhone. So our ability to have this diversity within that should be no surprise because we have an immense amount of diversity within the Finger Lakes. So ultimately that for me is one of the things that I think is really interesting here and one of the things that we really kind of focused on. The wine in your glass is 2014 Cab Franc. Um, and it is, for me, Cab Franc is a grape that wants to be expressed by showing pyrazinic elements. Um, that, that to me is a real signature of that grape. Um, and I think, well, People oftentimes talk about reducing pyrazines. Uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. If you want to plant Cab Franc and have no pyrazines, just fucking plant Merlot. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. So I have, I love that sort of herbal green, but still like black fruit driven style that I think the Finger Lakes can produce. And I think Rick's talked about it a couple of times. At, we can get full ripeness here at incredibly low alcohol levels. So for me, one of the things that I find exciting is, you know, not being somebody that wants my wine super physiologically ripe. Like I don't like, I'm not into jammy flavors and not into cooked fruit and things like that. Um, I find the ability to get the fruit where I want it from a ripeness standpoint and still have it be 12 to 12 and a half percent alcohol is really, really exciting here. Well, yeah, yeah, it says 11 to 14. Uh, so... <laughs> Is this the savoriness for me, the, 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 the wine? Is that, that, that savory note that comes through, which yeah. is, um, you know, the, I, I don't know. But, I mean, is it sometimes a bit of a, a balancing act, or not a dilemma, perhaps, when you're talking to, um, to buyers who are so familiar with what they think Cabernet Franc should taste like, or what they think a Riesling should taste like, and then they taste something like this, which is not at all what they might be, be used to from, you know, familiar parts of France, but, um, or, 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 or do you think you just, just, just go for your own style and that's what you make? And so I think, you know, I think one of the things I'm sure everybody on this call and everybody across the state would agree with is that none of us are trying to emulate what anybody else is doing. Um, you know, I'm not trying to make wine like, like in Chinon, I'm not trying to make wine like Bourgogne. Um, but that being said, I, I actually personally find that there's a fair amount of similarities, especially when we compare other New World versions of the grape variety. So whether we're looking at like Oregon or Sonoma Pinot next to, uh, next to Finger Lakes Pinot next to Burgundy, I think Finger Lakes is gonna swing definitively more towards one style than the other. And the same thing for Cap Franc. I mean, when I think of, of what people might think Cap Franc is in the new world, while this may not be it, I think this is much more similar to what people find in their sort of old world taste memories. So yeah, yeah. And for me, I'm always looking to make wine. You know, my goal is to make wine that develops. You know, I wanna make wines that are 20, 30, 40 year wines. For me, the wine in its infancy like it is now isn't really, that to me isn't what's exciting. It's, it's getting to taste those wines when, when they're 30 and 40 years old that I'm really looking for. Right. I'm just aware of our time, um, just into the last five minutes or so. We've had a few questions coming through, sort of asking about picking up on the, on the diversity and um, what, what other kind of great varieties and, you know, 
what what else is being made there outside of the classic varieties? I mean, can you just give us a sense of? I mean, like people talk about hybrids there, and there's like Gamay and some German varieties, Italian varieties. I mean, what what is the the actual picture in terms of what's being what's working? I suppose really. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm so excited. I have to answer this first. Um, so we have uh, two brand new things this year. Um, we just during the prep time of, of this, uh, this panel, we've grown from 85 acres to 94 acres. So our fifth vineyard, uh, we've uh, leased Syrah, Terraldigo, and Lagrine. So our winemaker Russell Hearn, he just loves Italian, Northern Italian varietals. And uh, he has made a Terraldigo Lagrine released for this year. Okay. Also, um, our second label, Bridge Lane, we, um, Russell recently sourced some fruit. It, our AVA for uh, Bridge Lane is New York State. So it's, a, you know, it more expanding than just our area. Um, and most of the fruit is from our estate, but he sourced some fruit also from Seneca Lake, um, Sable Blanc, Muscat, and uh, uh, La Crescent, which is a hybrid, which um, is exciting. He wanted to challenge himself and... Uh, yeah. Well, I, remember, I remember when I met some producers in early in the year, they were talking about this Californian winemakers being interested in New York because there's so much potential there to, to give things a go. I mean, Rick, do you want, do you want to pick, pick up on that in terms of what you're seeing or what you're hearing in terms of which varieties or things you think may, be, may, may, may work well in New York State in the future? Uh, there's, there's, there's things that you do because it's interesting and you want to experiment. Um, and, and then there's things that you do because you're viable in the world stage, right? So um, there's, you know, there's the, the, all the vinifers, you know, there's Capsaw, there's, believe it or not, uh, Syrah, which is really cool. Uh, not a lot of it, but Syrah can be fantastic. Um, there's, there's, you know, some people with Shannon, but Shannon doesn't like winter very much. Um, there is some Sauv Blanc, um, there's Gruner. I mean, there's a whole list of stuff and, and these things are interesting. Um, are they ever going to be major plantings? Are they going to be internationally? Is this where, how we're going to get a seat at the table internationally? I think it's going to be difficult to, uh, to have any volume on a lot of these, these grapes. They will be intellectually very interesting, but I think um, inter internationally where we're going to get a seat at the table will be, at least in the Finger Lakes, will be uh, dry Riesling, Cabernet Franc, and maybe if we plant more uh, and we all take a big heaping dose of crazy uh, Pinot, because Pinot is very difficult and you have to be slightly crazy to want to work with it, but the results can be fantastic. Uh, we just need more. Yeah. Chris, have you got a view on that? Yeah, I mean, I think historically, obviously, natives were a really big thing here, as uh, have been hybrids. Um, and I think we, there has been a, sh a pretty big shift away from that style, though some of the cool kids are now looking back at, at, at playing with some of those things, and we're seeing, we're seeing it taken up in a particular category, I guess. Um, so are you and I not cool kids? <laughs> not anymore, dude. Not anymore. Uh, and so, like, old folk like us now are focused, and I, and I think one of the things that I really agree with, with Rick is, the importance of what is actually going to be viable in the long term. I mean, Shannon was, mm. Shannon was cool for like eight minutes here. And I don't think, I haven't heard anybody talk about it in two years, but I don't think anybody cares about Shannon anymore, uh, which is, I don't know, good or bad, I'm not sure. Um, but there are a bunch of great varieties that I have seen actually some success with that are interesting, that may be interesting for people to know about. And Saparavi for me is one that like, mm. I don't like it's not my thing but like I've seen a lot of folks with it planting planted and I've seen some really good results I've been really impressed with those things um uh Blaufrankisch is another one that I think has done really well um and I've made a couple and I've really enjoyed working with the fruit and it seems to handle our winters and all that cool stuff so those I think are just a couple of examples of some of that diversity and as I said I 
I'm obsessed with making Grenache here. I have made a friggin' tiny quantity of Grenache for the last like five years. And I think it's stunning. I mean, I don't know that it's ever gonna live, but it's stunningly good if it does. So we keep playing with that. Yeah, yeah, but, but as you've been saying all through the all through the session, you know, it's still very early days. So you know, who, who knows if we do this in five years' time, there could be some of those varieties could, could well could well be be. Uh... And, and we're gonna have to find out where they work because yeah. it like almost every grape that we're talking about, no, no grape could be planted everywhere in the Finger Lakes. Even as hardy as Riesling is, you have to be in certain areas. But then when you start to get down to Pinot, like Rick talked about, which I agree with 100, percent but it only grows in a couple places. Syrah, even less. And honestly, though, like Chardonnay only does well in a couple of places here. Gewürzt is really sensitive and only does well in really protected places. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be planting it. Like all great wine regions are sporadic. No, you know, whether you look at the Mosel or you look at Burgundy, it is not a consistent thing that you can plant from all the way on that side to 100 miles that way with the same grape. No. Not at all. It doesn't work that way here. But it's okay. Well, um, that sort of brings us to sort of the formal end of it all. Just, just before we go, uh, we, are all, we are all living in this very strange world. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm sitting in a bedroom in, in, uh, in Battersea in London and you're, you're all over parts of New York State and we've got people all over the world watching. Um, just as a final thought, I mean, uh, when, when you can travel again, you know, where, where would be number one for you to, to, go, to go and travel from a, well, I don't know, from a wine point of view and also from a from a life point of view, where, where, where would you want to jump on a plane next to go? Who wants to go first or that? Uh, that's easy. I, I, <laughs> I, turned, uh, I turned 50. Uh, I, I know it's hard to tell. I know. Um, it's all this low alcohol wine. It's, it's, it's amazing for you. Um, back to the Alps. I skied in the Alps with two winemaker buddies, my partner and another buddy of mine from the back. And, uh, and, and, uh, had great views, great place, great people, great everything, great wine, uh, cheese. I mean, I like the Alps a whole bunch. So my wife has uh, has demanded under penalty of separation, I believe, <laughs> that we are heading back to the Alps as soon as possible. That's brilliant. Okay. Hey, May, how about you? Yes. Um, so I just want to say for the record, we, we have 16 different grapes at, at Lieb, but... Um, I, I personally especially love sparkling wine, and I am curious about visiting uh, English sparkling wine country. Oh, very good. Excellent. You'd be very welcome. And Christopher, <laughs> final will to you, sir? Uh, back to Japan. Yeah, absolutely. Pretty sure. Okay, and, and if, I, if I get a choice, I'll, I'll, I'll come to New York. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Come on over. Make it easy. Okay, great. Well, thank, thanks for all your time. Thanks for all our panelists. And uh, thanks to everybody around the world for watching. And um, I think we can follow up afterwards with questions and stuff. So if there's anything we haven't asked, uh, please do. And we'll, uh, we'll sort that out. But um, in the meantime, well, cheers. Enjoy, enjoy your afternoons and your evenings or your mornings, depending on where you are. Thanks for joining us, y'all. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you to our panel um, and to all of our attendees. A recording of today's webinar will be published to our YouTube channel in the next couple of days, and all of you participants will receive an email with that link. And we hope that you'll join us next month as we continue this series of New York State of Wine on October 21st at 5 p.m. BST. Uh, Felicity Carter of Meininger's Wine Business International will host a panel of winemakers. So thank you again. Wishing you all a safe and enjoyable week. <laughs>